Well, amen. Thank you to those who have led us so well in worship. So we now draw our attention to the Word of God, if you join me in a moment of prayer. Heavenly Father, we are thankful uh, for this moment of worship. We're thankful that we can sing our praises to you, shoulder to shoulder with brothers and sisters in the Lord. We rejoice in the celebration of baptism as we remember our own. And we pray that our worship would continue as we now open up our Bibles and meditate upon the Word that you have given to us. And we pray that you would free us from anything that would keep us from hearing from you. That your words would break through the things that weigh heavy on our hearts. That your words would break through all the thoughts bouncing around in our minds this morning. May our worship continue as we cling to your word. And Father, I pray as the one with the task of preaching that this would be all about you and not about me, that if any of my words slip in, may they fall to the floor, may they quickly be forgotten, may your words remain. May your words bear fruit in us. We pray these things in Jesus' name, amen. In the book of Judges, we find the refrain, they did what was right in their own eyes. We see this in Judges 17.6. In Judges 21, 25, we find the similar refrain, they did what was evil in the eyes of the Lord. In Judges 2, 11, 3, 7, 3, 12, 4, 1, 6, 1, 10, 6, and 13, 1. Over and over again. The people of God did what was right in their own eyes. The, the people of God did what was evil in the eyes of the Lord. As ones created in the image of God, we are prone to wander from our Creator. As the hymn writer put it, Prone to wander, Lord, I feel it. Prone to leave the God I love. In biblical terms, this is called sin. And it stems from an event we call the fall. And now the fall happened in a garden long ago but it has left a tidal wave of destruction. We're well into a series now on the good news, but to truly understand the good news, we need a grasp on the fall. So if you join me in Genesis chapter 3, very beginning of our Bible, the third chapter of our Bible, we will read Genesis 3, 1 through 19. And uh, we've had a very full service this morning, which means I'm going to have to read Genesis 3 much faster than normal. Um, which just means it's going to be at average speed um, for everyone else. Um, Genesis chapter 3, verse 1, if you're ready for the Word of God, can I hear a big loud amen? amen. Verse 1, now the serpent was more crafty than any of the wild animals the Lord God had made. He said to the woman, did God really say? 
you must not eat from any tree in the garden. The woman said to the serpent, we may eat fruit from the trees in the garden, but God did say, you must not eat from the tree that is in the middle of the garden. You must not touch it or you will die. Verse 4, you will not certainly die, the serpent said to the woman, for God knows that when you eat from it, your eyes will be opened and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. When the woman saw that the fruit of the tree was good for food and pleasing to the eye and also desirable for gaining wisdom, she took some and ate it. She also gave some to her husband who was with her, and he ate it. Then the eyes of both of them were opened, and they realized they were naked. They sewed fig leaves together and made coverings for themselves. Then the man and his wife heard the sound of the Lord God as he was walking in the garden in the cool of the day, and they hid from the Lord God among the trees of the garden. But the Lord God called to the man, Where are you? He answered, I heard you in the garden, and I was afraid because I was naked, so I hid. And he said, Who told you that you were naked? Have you eaten from the tree that I commanded you not to eat from? The man said, The woman you put here with me, she gave me some fruit from the tree, and I ate it. Then the Lord God said to the woman, What is this you have done? And the woman said, The serpent deceived me, and I ate. So the Lord God said to the serpent, because you have done this, cursed are you above all livestock and all wild animals. You will crawl on your belly and you will eat dust all the days of your life. And I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your offspring and hers, and he will crush your head and you will strike his heel. And then to the woman he said, I will make your pains in childbearing very severe. With painful labor, you will give birth to children. Your desire will be for your husband, and he will rule over you. To Adam, he said, because you listened to your wife and ate fruit from the tree about which I commanded you, you must not eat from it. Cursed is the ground because of you. Through painful toil, you will eat food from it all the days of your life. It will produce thorns and thistles for you and you will eat the plants of the field. By the sweat of your brow, you will eat your food until you return to the ground. Since from it you were taken, for dust you are, and to dust you will return. Amen. To Genesis 3, 1 through 19, from that powerful passage, I have a few words for you this morning, and the first is this. God's Word is frequently distorted. If you were with us last week, we discussed creation. And from looking at Genesis 1 and 2, we learned a lot about creation. We learned that we were created by God. And not only that, we were created in God's image. And not only that, we were created for God's glory. But here in Genesis chapter 3, the story takes a turn. It, it begins with Adam and Eve in the garden, which God graciously gave to them to steward. And those God created very good in Genesis 1 choose to do what is right in their own eyes in Genesis chapter 3. It, you know the story well. We will rehearse just a few of the details. The, the serpent poses a crafty question. He says, did God really say you must not eat from any tree in the garden? Now, we don't have time for this now, but maybe some of you have a problem with a talking snake in a garden. I mean, that's what the Bible says, but let's say you have a problem with that. Let me just address you. I think we all, no matter what we believe about Genesis 3, I think we all have voices whispering in our ear. 
leading us away from what God would intend for us? If you've got a problem with the talking snake in Genesis 3, I just ask, well, what do those whispering voices say to you? The serpent asked a crafty question. And you can go back to Genesis, Genesis chapter 2. I encourage you to do so. Uh, Genesis chapter 2, verses 16 and 17. And, and you can read exactly what God said. And in reality, God was gracious. He gives Adam and Eve the entirety of the garden. God is gracious. He gives them freedom to eat from any tree. He, he just gives them one small prohibition. He says, do not eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And in response, again, folks created very good in Genesis 1, here in Genesis chapter 3, choose to do what is right in their own eyes. In response to the serpent, Eve distorts the word of God. First, she adds a prohibition. She, she said, God told us to not even touch it. That's not true. That's not what God said. And, and she also, you know, secondly, while she's already added to God's Word, she, she also subtracts from it. God's statement was quite clear and quite severe. He said, if, if you eat from this tree, you shall certainly die. When Eve recites this prohibition and this consequence back to the talking serpent, she says, you will die. Now, I realize that sounds minor, but she has lessened the severity. It seems really minor in our English. In the original Hebrew, this is plain and obvious. She has distorted God's Word. And then you keep reading the story, as we just did very quickly, and it only gets worse. Uh, Eve distorts God's Word, and then the serpent negates it. The serpent says, you will not certainly die. Now, this is the exact opposite of what God instructed. And then the serpent offers an alternative. It's not that if you eat from this, you will die. The serpent says, if you eat from this, you will be like God. Now, again, we're long days removed from the garden. But I wonder how many of us have bought into the lie that through sin we might have life. Genesis chapter 3 is a story of Adam and Eve distorting God's clear instructions. It's a message for us today that God's Word is not up for debate. God's Word is not merely what it means to you. God's Word is not merely what it means to me. God's Word is what God means. And words matter. If you were here last week, we saw words matter so much that through words, God spoke the world into existence. Doing what is right in your own eyes begins with a distorted word. My next word for you this morning, God's Word is frequently defied. I realize we read through this 
story. It's got lots of twists and turns. It's got a lot of powerful images. Again, I encourage you, as I always do, go back to Genesis 3 and read it slowly and meditate upon it. But after Eve has distorted the word, her defying of God's word is deliberate. If you read the passage again, she saw the fruit. Now, remind you, she's not supposed to eat. She saw it. Hmm. She, she saw that it was good for food. It, we're told that she saw that it was pleasing to the eyes. Now, remember the story. God had given them everything, one prohibition. The word had been distorted. Now she looks at that one tree. She looks upon it. pleasing to the eye. It's good for food. And now she has this misguided notion that it would be good for wisdom. She trusted her stomach. She trusted her eyes. She trusted her own wisdom. She trusted the word of the serpent over the word of her creator. You keep reading the story very closely. We're, we're told that Adam was with her. And many times we, we give Adam the pass here because at first glance he, he seems like the passive participant. But no, he knew the clear instructions. He knew the clear instructions, and not only did he know the clear instructions, but he never stepped in. He never stopped it. He never prevented his wife from making a mistake. Adam, too, took the wisdom of the serpent over the wisdom of his creator. And, and you can see how this happened. Once the Word of God is distorted, it becomes quite easy to defy it. Once we distort what God says about a fruit or marriage or sex or idols, or, or possessions, or sin of any sort. Once we distort, we're only steps away from defying the Word of God. Doing what is right in your own eyes begins with a distorted word. Doing what is right in your own eyes is the end result of defying God's Word. My final point for you this morning, if you're still with me, can I hear an amen? Disobedience brings consequences. Again, I invite you to read slowly through Genesis 3, but as we read Genesis 3, we, we see an invitation to confess. God approaches Adam and Eve and asks a question that he already knows the answer. It, where have you been? He's inviting them to confess where they've been and what they've done. But Adam's sin has led him to shame and fear, and guilt. And then if we keep reading the story, it eventually turns into blame shifting. Adam blames Eve. Eve blames the serpent. And fallen people have been blame shifting 
ever since. There's an invitation to confess, and then as we keep reading Genesis 3, there's judgment upon the serpent. Because the serpent tripped up the man, the serpent will be destroyed by man. As we keep reading Genesis 3, there's judgment upon the man and the woman. Adam and Eve came from dirt, and they will return to dirt. Eve will struggle in childbirth. Adam, who was given the land to tend to it, will now have it fight against him until the day he dies. And God had made the promise, if you disobey, you will surely, certainly die. Always remember, God is faithful to his promises. In their disobedience, Adam and Eve died a spiritual death in the garden on their way to a physical death. The fall happened in the garden long ago, and it's led to a tidal wave of destruction ever since. If we keep reading, we see this tidal wave of destruction throughout the Old Testament. The Israelites will worship a golden calf. They will coordinate, uh, cord- they, they will crown a king rather than worship God. David will pursue adultery and murder and a cover-up. Solomon will pursue hundreds of wives and invite in false gods of all sorts. The, The prophets will speak of the need for repentance, and it eventually leads to the people of God in exile. We keep reading. We see the wake of destruction throughout the Old Testament. And if we're brave enough, we can see the wave of destruction move from the Old Testament and into our own lives. Rather than obedience to God, we find joy in success addiction, sex, worldly pleasures, work, appearance, achievement, money, and more. The fall leads to the destruction of our bodies and our marriages and our relationships. It leads to the destructions of our minds and our hearts and more. The fall also leads to the destruction of our relationship with God, which leads to rebellion and isolation and eventually separation from God. As I like to say, the consequences of the fall lead to hell on earth and simply hell. If we look around, if we're brave enough, We can look around and we can see the tidal wave of destruction. And if we know our Bibles well enough, we can look around and see this as a consequence of the fall. We live in a world that celebrates doing what is right in your own eyes. This sets us up for next week. What's the solution? What's the cure for our sin problem? We know the answer. I pray we know the answer. What's the cure? What's the solution to the problem? Well, it's Jesus. 
Jesus who provides abundant life now on the way to eternal life. Just a sneak peek at next week. We've, we've looked at the creation and God's plan for us. We've looked at, at how we ignore God's plan and do what's right in our own eyes. And it leads to hell on earth and simply to hell. Well, what's the cure? What's the solution? Well, it's Jesus who, who died on a cross to save us from the destruction caused by the fall and our own sin. And Jesus rose from the grave, defeating sin and death and crushing the head of the serpent. We're feeling the consequences of the broken world we live in and we've participated in. I call you to lean upon the Lord. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, I thank you for this group gathered here that we have spent this time in worship. We've entered into this sanctuary because to some degree we know that you are God and we are not. May you use our time here to draw us closer, wherever we may be, whether we're by your side or we're miles and miles and miles away from you. May you use this moment to draw us closer. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. As we conclude this service, a few moments.